Good morning. Welcome to Tip Off Today. We'll open it up with my usual first twitches and trying to get comfortable and all that kind of stuff. It seems I rewatched a few of these and was laughing about it. Hope you're well. Thanks for tuning in, whether it's at iTunes or just live on the computer on the audio version or if it's at YouTube on the video version. Remember to like us on Facebook at Lockdown Sports. We've been uh, shut down at 5,000 friends now on Facebook. A uh, few have dropped off, which has allowed me to add one or two. But, uh, yeah, so we are... Uh, we are at 5,000 on the David Locke site. So like us on Locked on Sports, I'd rather we had more. I'd rather do it the other way. But unfortunately, that's the way it is. What a weekend of basketball. That was insane. And, and yeah, we watch the playoffs in, enjoyment-wise, but I obviously am watching the playoffs a great deal with kind of an eye on how does this relate to the Jazz? What can Kevin O'Connor do to emulate some of these things? And, and one of the things that jumped out at me was I watched – you know, New Orleans, and they had Trevor Ariza, who's a great wing defender. Memphis, they had Tony Allen, who's a great wing defender. And I, and I really do believe that this has become one of the most unsung positions in the game right now, and that is that of the wing defender. In, in the old days, it was you had to have the big guy at the top, and if you had the big guy uh, guarding the rim, then that classified you as a good defensive team. But I'm, I really am beginning to believe that the, the elite – kind of a position that changes and is undervalued a little bit is the wing defender. And so you think about, okay, well, New Orleans added a Reza and they, and they got dramatically better defensively. Memphis added Tony Allen and picked up Shane Battier during the season. So well, why couldn't the Jazz do that? Well, in a sense, that's, that's what Kevin O'Connor tried to do. Raja Bell just didn't come through. You know, Raja Bell was thought of. I don't think any of us thought Raja Bell was going to have a struggle defensively. He executed the defensive plan. He was always near the top of their, of their defensive voting systems. Uh, and, and, but I just thought athletically he slipped a little bit, 34 years old, along the way. And, and so you tried to do that. Earl Watson's an, an elite-level defensive player uh, generally. And so those two, you're like, okay, well, you tried to do it. It just didn't work. And then the other one that jumped out at me as I was watching, you know, Allen's tough and Marco Bellinelli's tough and these kind of undervalued players on the second-tier playoff team that are surviving, and, and they're just tough. Well, again, that's where Raja – and Earl and Francisco were supposed to bring that to this team. So it didn't work, but I do at least feel as though, and it worked for a while, I do feel at least uh, that the, the, the concepts are right. Uh, and in regards to the wing defender, it gets into one of the more interesting debates for the Jazz all se- off season, and that is that of Andre Karolinko. Uh, and I'll write more about this coming up on the website, but the 82games.com does – uh, some analysis and some research and and on 82games.com one of the things they have is points allowed um basically production by your opponent is one of the things that they're able to the show Andre Gudala came out as the number one guy in the NBA Dwight Howard two these aren't surprises Luel Deng three LeBron James four that that certainly passes the eyeball test as some of the best defenders in the game Ronnie Brewer actually came out sixth on that to his credit and then there were some surprising ones later Ray Allen comes out as ninth, which I have a hard time believing. But the the fifth best defender, or the guy who creates the allows the least amount of production, uh, at his uh, the guy he's guarding was Andre Karolinko. And so here's another one of those really, really, really difficult decisions for the Utah Jazz that you have Andre Karolinko as one of the better defensive players in the league, and what do you do with him in the off season? Flip it around to something we've been talking about a great deal, which is Paul Millsap. You know, according to 82games.com, Dwan Blair allowed the highest amount per position, followed by Beadrins, followed by Villanueva, followed by rookie Ed Davis and Andre Bargnani. Those were the five defenders who allowed the most points a guy guarding. Well, you know what? That matches pretty well. Six was Jeff Green, that eyeball test. Seven was the rookie Greg Monroe, and eight was Paul Millsap, eighth worst defensive player at in the NBA at allowing points at, at his position. So... You know, I don't know what I totally think of this statistical breakdown by 82games.com, but I thought it was interesting when you look at it from a jazz standpoint of here you have the the teams we're watching in the playoffs and and their toughness and their defensive elements and and that value of that wing defender in this day and age who can actually guard someone. And, And, you know, one of the guys from the jazz standpoint you're gonna have to look at is that of Andre Karolinko. So worth just taking a quick second on that. Some amazing games. Obviously, some of my favorite players all had a, uh, Fabulous game. Shane Battier hit the big three. Ray Allen hit the big three. Nick Collison played very well for the Thunder, though I'd like them to never win a game, so I'm not that excited about that. Uh, a lot, lot, of, lot of good things there. I think Memphis is interesting because Memphis is defying logic. They're winning 
with a low post game and a power game. And I watched Randolph and Gasol and thought to myself, well, there's no reason why that can't be Jefferson and Favors. Uh, the Jazz need to figure out how they're going to defend with Jefferson on the floor. They didn't do that last year. And maybe Favors is going to allow them to do it the same way Gasol somehow turned Zach Randolph into an adequate defensive player. I did a breakdown today at Locked on Jazz about those uh, Jefferson and Randolph, who's better, who's not. And you can look at that one, and then they've got a point guard in Mike Conley who's very similar to Devin Harris. And then they've got some wing players that, frankly, aren't as good as some of our wing players, but they're tougher. And so there's a real value to that toughness. Uh, speaking of the Jazz adding players in the future, they got bad news today as Harrison Barnes is – uh, staying in college. He's a really nice player. And so now with Jared Sullinger and Harrison Barnes dropping off the NBA map on the draft board, you, you th- those are two guys that were projected to go in the early parts. And so now this draft is getting weak. Uh, I, I've been one who disputed how weak this draft was because I thought there was a lot of talent. I, but those guys are now going back to college. And next year's draft could be amazing. But there's definitely a weakness to this depending on who these European guys are. They're gonna, the European guys are going to sway the future of this draft, and I don't know anything about them yet. So I will have to look into them a little bit more, do some scouting for you uh, on all of them. All right, that's a quick check of just kind of what's going on. Uh, the spring game took place the other day at Utah, and I thought the most telling comment was Norm Chow afterwards when asked about the two young quarterbacks basically saying, we're going to have to go look around – to find someone to back up Jordan Wynn. Right now, if Jordan Wynn gets hurt, Utah is in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting discussion on Utah football going to the Pac-12. We'll hold it time in and time out. Um, right now, when we're not emotionally attached to the team and we haven't got into fall practice and haven't decided that everyone's going to be great and haven't got our angst up, it's an, it's an interesting question to try to figure out what do you really think Utah is going to be able to do next year in the Pac-12. And frankly, I have no idea. The only thing I, I, I feel is that I think there's going to be a week during the year where they just get blasted uh, out of fatigue, out of the burden of the schedule, out of playing that many good opponents, which they haven't done before. They're going to lose some game somewhere along the way by 25 or 30 points, just being dead and not being able to get away with it. And that's one of the transition points. But otherwise, when they're playing at relatively full strength and battling, they, I would think they should be okay, but I, I don't know. Maybe we're going to find out that, that it's just such a different world uh, to handle it week in and week out. It's going to be a very interesting season uh, in that regard. All right, there's your quick tip-off today. Hope you're enjoying the playoffs. Some good ones again tonight, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.